Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Nano Seminar Series of ICN2. Uh, today is our first seminar on the area of nanochemistry and materials, and our invited speaker is Professor Jana Weinshoff. Jana, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So before we start with her uh, conference, uh, I would like to introduce you to our junior researcher in our group, the Nanostructure Materials for Photovoltaic Energy, Masoud Terminpo. He's going to talk, give a 10 minute presentation of some work in our laboratory. Masoud. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for having me. I'm really glad to be here and presenting, uh, and it's a great honor for me to present the research results of the group uh, of nanostructuring materials for photovoltaic energy led by Professor Monica Lira. I will give you a brief talk, actually, and with a few examples of the exquisite works that have been performed in our group in recent years. Actually, the group has, work, has started working on photovoltaic devices from 2004, and they have progressed. They have done many, many type of solar cells, such as solid state density of solar cells, and also all oxide solar cells. But I will focus mostly on the application of the stability protocols, actually, in the study of stability protocols on the previous sky solar, lead halide previous sky solar cells. And the stability defines that if we continuously expose a solar cell to one, uh, for 1,000 hours, the efficiency shouldn't be lower than 10% uh, of uh, loss of the efficiency. So, I mean, the, 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 focus of, the research focus of the group has been uh, uh, mostly on the application of novel complexes and uh, solution process oxide, which are very important. Uh, for uh, fabrication of a stable and flexible solar, uh, previous sky solar cells, and also application of uh, ligand modifiers and additives. I will give you an exquisite example of the research results of the recent publication of the group, and also uh, uh, definitely application of carbons as a back contact, and also for uh, fabrication of uh, textile solar cells, and also humid resistive solar cells. So as you can see, here is a summary of the researches that has been done with, uh, uh, with high efficiency previous class solar cells. And all, in almost all of them, you can see the role of the metal oxide, uh, uh, the role of metal oxide fun functionality in fabrication of high efficiency and with the uh, very small amount of uh, last cell, cell performance. And then at the same time, you can see also if you want to have uh, uh, a very high, uh, a stable uh, previous case solar cell, you, you need also to use carbons for the future uh, commercialization of these type of solar cells. So the first, uh, we want to mention that in the group, there has been uh, a lot of endeavors on the fabrication of solution processed oxides, such as zinc oxide, titanium oxide, zirconium oxide, and nickel oxide, and their application uh, in the fabrication of different types of previous sky solar cells. Here, as an example, the uh, they have studied uh, actually the cesium doped nickel oxide as a uh, very excellent uh, HTL layer for the increase of the current density of the solar cells. And, uh, as you can see, the nickel phase has been removed after the doping with cesium, and uh, it has uh, led to the increase of the short current density of the solar cell and also with a very high stability. Another example is the application of novel complex uh, oxide which we don't think about them a lot because they are really insulator and it is ferroelectric materials. But as you can see, the ferroelectric materials in the term, uh, term of crystal structure of pre, uh, itself perovskite, they are also by themselves in, interesting in as a photovoltaic material. But we can think of them as a kind of a spin, uh, a spontaneous polarization material that uh, can lead after polling, they, they can lead to a high conductivity ETL layer. And then, as you can see, the concept of the polling here is that when you expose them to external voltage, after some time, they will start to, to do some charge extraction from the perovskite layer. And then we will have a functional perovskite. And as you can see, this is the results of the fabrication of uh, for, for, for electric material, uh, material as an ETL for these uh, solar cells. 
And this is a very exquisite con comparison with the, the uh, uh, conventional tin oxide uh, layers as ETL, as you can see, the device has, is very, very stable after uh, performing for, for like 500 uh, minutes under the continuous sunlight uh, exposure. <coughs> Another example also in, in the group, uh, besides the oxide uh, materials, is fun functionalization, of, functionalization of the oxide interfaces, actually using ligands. So the additive engineering has been uh, a focus of the research of the group. With different type of ligands, we can, uh, we can have a lot of uh, uh, type of structures that they can bind the, the two-dimensional, uh, proviscite to three-dimensional, and also oxides to two-dimensional. So in this way, for example, uh, Hai Bingjia and uh, Carlos Pereira, they have succeeded to perform uh, uh, the fab fabrication of solar cells, uh, proviscite solar cells with an additive that can uh, increase, uh, decrease, actually the hysteresis of the solar cell first uh, uh, very uh, significantly and at the same time they, ha they, ha they have been able to actually fabricate an impeccable performance of the solar cell as you can see here with almost no, no performance loss after 1000 hours. This is another example of the uh, application of ligands modification the fabrication of solar cell. And at the end the last example is about the fabrication of carbon uh, based proviscite solar cells. Then uh, this, uh, the group has also performed a lot of uh, endeavors on the fabrication of different types of using proviscite infiltration technique and also uh, application of ligands uh, uh, such as uh, amino valeronic acid iodide as a binder between the proviscite uh, and oxide and also uh, compatible with the carbon uh, based uh, carbon paste as a back contact which has led to the decrease and actually also some treatment in even in 70% uh, humidity, it has led to decrease of the hysteresis of the device with high performance actually. Uh, and uh, the highest efficiency that has been obtained by Carlos Pereira has been 14.4% and uh, uh, we are, they have been able to also fabricate it on textile as well. So this is the brief conclusion of the group efforts, as you can see here. Uh, so there are numerous uh, uh, significant uh, development in the fabrication of uh, uh, proviscite solar cells with different techniques and also functionalities in the group. And more recently, the group has moved also to work with artificial intelligence in terms of the application of machine learning and at the same time on the fabrication of stable proviscite solar cells that uh, we have a lot of uh, faculties and uh, members and also technicians uh, working, currently working on it at the same time. And here the acknowledgement, uh, of course, all the efforts has been done in collaboration with many great researchers and professors all around the world, and uh, especially and also uh, students, uh, PhD and postdoc students in the group as well. And we thank all uh, on behalf of the group and thank you for your attention. Any question? I am very open to it. Any question for Masood? Maybe we can leave it at the end all together. Okay, Masood, thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Thank you. So, we are now um, going to welcome our invited speaker, Professor Jana she, uh, she obtained a PhD in physics in 2011 from the University of Cambridge uh, under the supervision of Professor Richard Friend. From 2011 to 2013, she worked as a postdoc researcher at Cambridge and, and Princeton University. Then until 2019, she held different positions at the University of Heidelberg. Uh, the last position was a junior professor in organic electronics. Uh, since uh, October 1st, 2019, she's Professor of Novel Electronic Technologies at the University of Dresden. And she's right now the Chair of the Cluster between the Emerging Electronic Technologies, the Center of Advancing Electronics in Dresden, and the Institute of, of Applied Physics. Uh, she has received several awards. Right now, she held the uh, ERC starting grant since 2011 from the Com uh, European Commission, Diana. Thank you for being here. Welcome. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Hello, everybody. 
Um, you already heard a very nice introduction to the research done in Monica's group on perovskites. And so I assume that many of you already know what perovskites are. And I want to talk about an issue that we encounter, but I think every researcher encounters when, when they work with perovskites and that's reproducibility. So I will start with a, sorry, a short introduction to perovskites in general, just in case you have not yet heard of them. Um, these are materials that follow the crystal structure ABX3. And uh, in the A site, we have an either an organic cation like methyl ammonium or formidinium, or we have cesium as an inorganic one. In the B site, we have lead, sometimes tin. And in the X site, we have uh, halide, so iodine, bromide, or chlorine. And the reason that these materials are so fascinating um, is that their properties are really tailor-made for photovoltaics. They have very high absorption coefficients. Uh, the diffusion lengths for electrons and holes are also very, very large. Uh, they also have relatively high charge carry mobilities. And the most uh, interesting part is that they show really low energetic disorder, which means their Urbach energies are as low as those for gallium arsenide. Um, and in addition to that, they have a uh, high internal luminescence quantum efficiency, which means their combination in these materials is very low. And all of this is possible despite the fact that they are processed from solution and they're not annealed at high temperature. So it's a very simple fabrication method. And yet you get all these fantastic properties. And indeed, this manifests itself in the increase in the photovoltaic performance. You can see here in the graph that just over approximately a decade, we have now already surpassed 25% uh, percent in efficiency. Mm -hmm. So in my group, we look at different challenges that come with this technology, because you know, if we already have 25%, you really might ask yourself, why is this not an industrial product, um, which is as good as silicon, solar cells, and yet can be processed so much uh, easier. And there are a few challenges that still hinder the uh, transition to, to industry. One is stability, and you heard a few really nice examples just a few minutes ago. Uh, related to study of stability. We also look at that specifically in my group, we focus on environmental stability. So we look at how perovskites interact with um, environmental factors like oxygen. We also look at processability, specifically here uh, in the sense of, should we really follow the route of solution processing for perovskites or rather maybe evaporate them, which is much more compatible on an industrial scale with large uh, scale fabrication. More recently, we also started looking more into the sustainability of uh, perovskite solar cells. But today I wanna talk to you about reproducibility. So what does it mean reproducibility? I guess those of you who have made um, uh, perovskite solar cells in the past, you're quite familiar with this example. But what I see from my students is that sometimes you come to the lab, you make your perovskite solar cell and you, you see here a very basic architecture of the device and the perovskite is a uh, single cation MAPI, everything very simple. You make your device, you have a great VOC, but your current, your field factor, they're not very good. You're really disappointed because your performance is quite low. You come the next day, you do the exact same thing, same recipe, you make a new device. This time, the current and field factor are fantastic, but your VOC is very low. And then finally, all the stars align and everything uh, happens just in the right way, and you have a high VOC and a high um, current, high field factor, and you're happy with the device performance. And so when we started working on perovskites, this was very surprising to me. How come you could do the same thing and yet get different results? Um, so of course, we had to check. Is it something that is a problem just for us? Are we doing something wrong? And looking at literature very quickly, you realize that this is a common issue. So it became so common that people do not present a single value for the performance of their device, but rather they present a histogram with dozens or sometimes even hundreds of devices so that you can really see that the spread in performance is really very large. Um, I also very much like this paper. I guess uh, uh, those of you in the field uh, know this. It's called how to make over 20% efficient Proskett solar cells in the different device architectures. And the reason I like it is that the authors were very honest about the performance of their devices. So you can see here three different architectures, planar, mes uh, mesoporous, and also the inverted. And you can see that 
the spread and the efficiency is really quite remarkable, right? So even at the point where they have reached the 20%, they still have, so for example here, they have a few devices which are above 20% and the vast majority show a much lower performance. So I actually feel like maybe a, a, a fairer title to this paper should have been how to make a few over 20% uh, efficient solar cells. There's also other inconsistencies and issues in literature. So if you, for example, are interested in the electronic structure of perovskites and you look at the ionization potential, you can find reports with any value between 5.1 to 6.6. .6. So essentially, you know, if you want to cite something, you could choose whichever one you like. In terms of stability for the same device structure, same composition, some people report just tens of hours and other people report thousands of hours. The dielectric constant, even something as basic as that, for the same composition of perovskite is shown to vary from five to 50, so one order of magnitude. Um, in terms of the composition that leads to an improved uh, photovoltaic performance, there is a lot of debate whether this is excess lead iodide or excess MEI. So again, clearly something is, uh, is unknown there. And in terms of photoluminescence, it's a very common method to measure uh, perovskites and, you know, people extract all sorts of useful properties from photoluminescence measurements, but both the quantum efficiency of the photoluminescence, uh, as well as how it behaves in different environments, really varies drastically in different papers. And we have summarized here in this review about photoluminescence and perovskites, just values reported for the PLQE of MAPI in different reports. And you can clearly see that basically have a huge scatter over many orders of magnitude. Um, and that shows that there is additional effects that take, you know, that, that, that need to be taken into account, like maybe the atmosphere or the presence of defects, the, the, the outcoupling, so the, the roughness of the sample. But we can't really assign a single PLQE value to the material. We really need to know more about the sample. And similarly with charge carrier mobility, um, especially when measured by uh, field effect transistors, you can have reports for the same composition as low as 10 to the minus six or as high as 20. So there's clearly a lot of inconsistencies. What we do generally agree on is that high crystallinity and low energetic disorder are necessary for high performance. And so when we started looking into that and we realized, okay, we need to understand why there is this variation in the performance. And so we decided to go all the way to the basics and say, how are these layers even made? And so we started with MAPI again, the model system, it's very simple. Um, what you do is you have a lead precursor, whichever one you're using, lead iodide, lead acetate, there's different options. You have your MAI, you weigh them, right? And then you add them at a certain ratio into your vial. Then you come with your solvent, which typically is DMF. You add the right amount of solvent and here you go, you have your precursor solution ready. You are ready to prepare your device. Alternatively, you could also make stock solutions of each of the precursors separately and then just mix them at a certain ratio. And this is how one would make MAPI, for example. Now, the problem is that Either method that you choose includes errors. You have errors in weighing and also transferring into your vial, right? So there will be some error in how much material you put in. You also might have an error in measuring the required volume. That might depend on the quality of your pipette or maybe some droplets that are left behind in your, um, uh, in your pipette tip. So these are all errors that will occur as you're making your device. And so we decided to test um, how sensitive are these uh, perovskites to these errors? So what do we do? We use a lead acetate best recipe in which in order to make MAPI, we need to mix uh, lead acetate and MAI at the ratio of one to three for the perfect stoichiometric MAPI. And we intentionally introduce very small deviations around this value of three. And we incorporate the perovskites into devices and we look into them. Um, and the question is really, I mean, those of you who, who like poetry, I guess you know this quote uh, from Alexander Pope, who said, to err is human, to forgive divine. And so we really wanted to see how forgiving are perovskites, or if you'd like, how divine are they? So 
we were very surprised to find out that when you introduce even very minor variations in stoichiometry, you really clearly see an effect on the photovoltaic performance. In particular, what you observe is that your VOC goes up. Your current is uh, pretty flat uh, across a certain region, and then it drops down uh, quite significantly once you go to over stoichiometric uh, devices. Very similar things happen also to the field factor. And so overall, then what happens is that you have an increase in PC until a certain slightly over stoichiometric ratio and then a decrease. And so we wanted to understand, first of all, why is the VOC increasing? And we thought, well, let's check if the small variations in stoichiometry could potentially change the band gap. But here you see the absorption measurements and they extract the band gaps and you can see that there is really no, no change. And so another possibility for the change in the VOC could be related to a change in energetics, right? So that will influence the building potential in the device. And indeed, where we performed uh, ultraviolet photoemission spectroscopy measurements, we observed that there is a shift, and you can see it here in the inset, where you have a clear shift with the change in the stoichiometry. And when you then extract your ionization potential, you can see that it varies um, across a large, you know, a range of values for under stoichiometric, it's much higher. It's around 6.2, almost 6.3, while for over stoichiometric, you have much lower values, around 5.6. So this already um, could provide an indication why do people report such different ionization potentials? Because they ended up potentially accidentally or unintentionally making samples with slightly different stoichiometries, and that very heavily impacts the ionization potential of the surface. And as you increase the stoichiometry and you reduce the ionization potential, it actually causes an increase in the built-in potential, which then results in increase in VOC. If you compare the change, so I, I have here the, the um, diagram to show what is happening. And so if you compare really the onset of the conduction band with respect to the Fermi level with the measured VOC, you see that they follow a trend very nicely, and that's again, because you increase the built-in potential, you increase the VOC with it. Now, another way to visualize the increase in the built-in potential is actually measure the devices um, just uh, under dark conditions. And you can see that in the dark conditions, of course, the device is a simple diode. And as you monitor the position of the knee, what's called, you know, you can see it here marked, of the knee at the JV characteristics, you see a clear shift to higher voltages for over stoichiometric devices. So we already observed drastic changes in device performance. Of course, what about device stability? So here we monitored the stability of the devices. And this is just a shelf stability test, which means devices are periodically measured and then placed back uh, in the lab without encapsulation and um, just in ambient, just as, a, as the conditions are. And you can see here a measurement, it is, I think about 3,600 hours, which is about half a year. And so over half a year, you see that certain devices are actually very stable and some are not. So specifically the under stoichiometric devices, while they started with a somewhat lower efficiency, they're actually incredibly stable. So after half a year, they still maintain 80% of their initial performance. On the other hand, over stoichiometric devices, yes, they show you an initial high performance, but they degrade very, very rapidly. And so after half a year, they are only at about 30% of their initial performance. You also can see that by monitoring the hysteresis index, we see that over stoichiometric devices develop hysteresis, while the under stoichiometric ones uh, maintain the hysteresis free nature of these devices. So um, the conclusion here is that not only the performance, but also the stability of the device is very heavily impacted by the stoichiometry of your solution. Now, to understand why that is, we first uh, use some of the knowledge we already had about the gradation of perovskites, which is um, that the gradation in environmental conditions typically is triggered by the grain boundaries and then progressively consumes entire grains, as you can see it uh, in one of our earlier publications. And that typically means that smaller grains degrade faster than larger grains. And so um, we were wondering if perhaps changing the stoichiometry of the samples is actually changing the microstructure of our perovskite, and that impacts the device stability. 
But when we looked at the SEM images obtained from all of the different stoichiometries, apart from a few very small white flakes highlighted here in red, in the case of the understoichiometric layers, which makes sense, you have a little bit of excess lead iodide um, at the surface simply because you do not put in enough MAI to really convert everything to perovskite. But apart from these um, small flakes, we really see that there is no change in the microstructure. So all the uh, layers consist of small grains of about 250 nanometer in size, and there is no big change. So there has to be something else that causes uh, this big effect in terms of stability. And our idea was potentially that it's the density of defects that changes. And so to characterize that, we performed XPS measurements where we looked at the composition at the surface. We monitored lead, iodine, nitrogen, and carbon. And we then plotted the ratios between iodine to lead and nitrogen to lead um, across the range of stoichiometries that we investigated. As you can see here, it drastically increases uh, as you change the stoichiometry. So to give you maybe one example, if you look at the uh, perfect stoichiometric device with stoichiometry of three, and you look at the nitrogen, to lead ratio, it's about one, which is what one would expect. But then if you just increase the uh, amount of MAI to three or six, so basically this is a 2% increase in the, in the stoichiometry, you actually get nitrogen uh, to lead ratio of 1.6, so 60% increase. So that means with these very, very small changes in the precursor solution stoichiometry, you induce very large changes in the density of both MA and iodine ionic defects at the surface. And the increased defect density is the responsible factor for reducing the device stability of overstoichiometric devices. Now, uh, we also confirmed that by doing PLQE measurements and monitoring both the initial uh, photoluminescence as well as its evolution with uh, uh, with exposure to air of different stoichiometric samples. And what you can see is that the initial PLQE of understoichiometric samples is significantly higher than that of overstoichiometric. And that's because the density of traps is lower. But more than that, it also increases upon exposure to air because the defects that are there are shallow and can be easily healed. And that suggests that the defects that are present in understoichiometric devices are iodine uh, vacancies, which again makes sense. You don't put enough MAI, you end up with a lot of iodine vacancies. And those heal over time, and so they lead to an increase in the PLQE. Now, even more recently, we collaborated with the group of uh, Carson Dipel in Chemnitz University, and we performed um, the LTS and impedance spectroscopy measurements on the various stoichiometries, and we could monitor directly the various um, uh, densities of the ions in terms of MA vacancy, interstitial, and iodine interstitial. And again, we saw that our hypothesis re uh, regarding the increased amount of iodine interstitials or for overstoichiometric samples, as well as MA interstitial for overstoichiometric samples, is fully confirmed. And that's the reason for the reduced stability. So, next we looked at the crystallinity because I want to remind you we said, you know, we, we generally assume that the more crystalline the layer is, the better it is for device performance. And here, among the various um, stoichiometric films, we saw that generally the crystal structure is unchanged. So we have a tetragonal crystal structure. But when we monitor the intensity of the peak of 110, we actually saw that the most crystalline samples are the ones which are under stoichiometric. So that is not the one that gives you the high performance. So that means that high crystallinity is not a guarantee of high performance. And there are other factors um, that influence it. We also looked at the energetic disorder. And again, we always say low energetic disorder is good for your device performance. It will increase it. But here we monitored the Orbach energy. So this is the sharpness of the absorption edge measured here by phototermal deflection spectroscopy. And you can clearly see that understoichiometric samples have lower energetic disorder than overstoichiometric samples, and yet their efficiencies is not as high. So again, low energetic disorder is not a guarantee of high performance. At the end, I want to show you one very simple experiment 
that will allow you to test your samples and find out which stoichiometry do you really have. Because the issue when you actually work in the lab is that, of course, you don't do your full study on one set of samples, right? So you will create your devices in one batch, and then maybe the next batch you will make it for uh, XRD measurements, and maybe the next one for PL measurements, and so on and so on. How do you know that each of these batches has the same stoichiometry? And this is a very simple test. So here we monitor the PLQE of samples. And please note here, the changes from the stoichiometric point of view are in the third decimal place, right? So this is very, very small, minute changes in stoichiometry. And yet, as you monitor the evolution of the PLQE first in nitrogen, and the key point at some point you introduce oxygen, so you put dry air into your integrating sphere, you very clearly see that you can distinguish between changes in stoichiometry as little as 0 0.005, which is very, very small. And you can discern these variations by looking especially at the behavior in, in dry air. So generally speaking, over stoichiometric samples will always lead to a decrease once you introduce oxygen into the, into the measurement. And under stoichiometric samples will show a big increase. And so you can very clearly check which stoichiometry you have. And also you can compare between different batches with this very simple method to always make sure you're working in the same stoichiometric regime. So with this, to conclude, what we learned about MAPI is that fractional and most likely unintentional variations in precursor stoichiometry can impact many factors, right? So they can influence the composition of your layer, the energetics. They also will change the crystallinity, the energetic disorder, of course, the photoluminescence behavior, and most importantly, the performance and stability of your device. But interestingly, they do not have any impact on the absorption and on the microstructure, which if you think about it, are the two most common techniques that people apply to study uh, perovskite solar cells. And maybe that's why we are not aware that we're having these changes, um, even though they are there. So I believe that perovskites are not forgiving and actually require very high care and accuracy when you are fabricating them. Okay, so now let's go to something interesting. We talked about the model system. What about multiple cation perovskites, right? So typically people are using now triple cation perovskites and just imagine to yourself, you now have five different uh, components to weigh, to mix at a certain ratio, then add you, you, you add not just one solvent, you are now adding a mixture of solvents. And so there is just so many possible errors that can occur. So we decided to start first with looking at one particular error and that is organic versus inorganic. So we are looking at the triple cation perovskite and we introduce this factor X. If X is equal to one, this is a perfect stoichiometric composition. In case you have an under stoichiometric composition, so X is uh, between 0 0.9 and one, you have deficiency of organic cations, which is equ actually equivalent to having excess lead iodide in your perovskite. Or alternatively, you can go with X values above one. So you have over stoichiometric composition. And that means that you now have excess of organic cations and deficiency of lead iodide. So looking at literature, where should we be, over or under? The vast majorities of report are looking at over um, in, in, the, in the sense of adding some additional lead iodide. I guess those of you who are making perovskites are familiar. You make your, your composition and then you add some excess. And this all originates from the very first paper by uh, Michael Saliba, who reported that cesium containing triple uh, cation perovskites are very good. And so what they did here is they wrote in the SI that we know that the composition contains a lead excess as reported as elsewhere. And of course, this paper is very heavily cited and the vast majority of papers use uh, excess lead iodide. Why? Because they report it to be better. So here are some studies where they looked at the different ratios and they always see that if you have excess lead iodide, that's better. And so we decided to just check this. So I wanna remind you, under stoichiometric means excess lead iodide and over stoichiometric is deficiency of lead iodide. And so I asked a student of mine to investigate this and indeed she do, she, she fabricated and measured uh, over 400 devices, as you can see here, the statistics. And basically she came to me and she said, yeah, the results are as expected from literature. So if you have under stoichiometric composition, so that means you have excess lead iodide, uh, the performance is good. 
And if you go to the other range of overstoichiometric, the efficiency goes down. So we thought, okay, well, that's not very interesting. But the problem, or perhaps now the, the, the lucky thing was that I didn't want her to work on this very labor intensive project alone. And so I asked another student of mine to do the same experiment. And he came back with these results. So he said, yes, I also fabricated more than 400 devices. And in my case, it doesn't matter if you have it under stoichiometric or over stoichiometric. So over stoichiometric no longer lowers the photovoltaic performance. And so just to show you the striking difference, these are two different students working in the same lab. So they have the same precursors, they have the same glove box, they have everything the same. And yet the results are completely different. So looking at that, we of course felt like we we're falling down the rabbit hole. So we looked at everything, the precursors, the solvents, again, checking the stoichiometries, looking at the glove box environment, who was working after who, maybe there was some solvent, something unpredictable. We compared the recipe, we had them watch each other to try and understand what is going on. And finally, we realized like with the previous study, it's all about the basics. How are perovskite layers made? So of course we looked at the precursor solution that is made, but how are the actual films made? And unlike MAPI, in triple catan, what you do is you have the antisolvent step. So you start a spin coating of your precursor solution, and then you have your antisolvent that you apply, and then you anneal your film, right? So I guess you're all familiar with that. And there are many parameters and factors related to this antisolvent step that people have looked at. So first of all, of course, the choice of antisolvent. Also, how much antisolvent should you use? From which height should you deposit it? Should you use room temperature antisolvent or hot antisolvent? In which atmosphere are you depositing the antisolvent? Even the point in time at which you begin to, de to deposit your antisolvent uh, in your spin coating um, cycle has been checked. But what nobody seemed to have um, examined is what is the impact of the duration of the antisolvent application? And so to check this out, what we did is we decided to examine a series of 14 antisolvents. You can see all the chemical structures here. And we decided to check two um, antisolvent application speeds. And so to do so, um, to do it slowly, you use a small pipette, 250 microliter, which means just to push the plunger of the pipette to really extract and this one will take you longer. It will take you about 1.3 seconds. Or on the other hand, you could use the 1000 microliter pipette tip and then to push uh, the same volume of antisolvent out takes you less than 0.2 seconds. And indeed, this was the difference between the two students. They were doing everything the same. They were just using two different pipettes and you will see why this caused these um, changes. So apart from varying the speed of the deposition of the antisolvent, everything else was kept the same. So the volume of the antisolvent, we were working exclusively at room temperature. Everything was processed in a dry box, which of course for both students is the same dry box. And we always um, do the application uh, five seconds before the end of the spin coating. And so what did we observe? We observed that the antisolvents are split into categories. So in what we call type one antisolvents, which are the alcohols, if you deposit the antisolvent fast, you actually get good devices with maybe the exception of uh, ethanol where the devices are at about 15 to 17%, but they're still pretty good and much, much better than when you do it slowly and then you get very low performance. So you can see below 5% for ethanol. In the second category of uh, antisolvents, so there is all sorts of antisolvents in there, it doesn't really matter much if you do it slowly or if you do it fast, you end up with good performance. And you will see, maybe you will first think, well, number four clearly doesn't obey that, but later you will understand why uh, four is actually in the border between uh, uh, category one and category two of antisolvents. So I'll explain that in a, in a bit. And finally, there is a type three antisolvent um, category where the exact opposite is happening. So when you use the um, slow deposition, you have very good devices. When you use the fast deposition, you have not only much worse devices, you also have a much larger spread in the photovoltaic performance. And in the case of mesotelin, it's quite remarkable if you do it 
um, fast, you can't make any devices at all. So you just don't get any performance. While if you do it slowly, you get still very reasonable devices. And so to examine that and to look more closely at what's going on, we first look at the SEM. So this is type one antisolvents, again, the alcohols. If you do it fast, you have uh, the normal expected uh, microstructure of triple cations. So you have large uniform grains. You do have some excess of lead iodide at the surface. And if you, on the other hand, do it slowly, you observe, first of all, significantly more lead iodide on the surface. And you also sometimes notice pinholes both throughout the film and also uh, near the interface of the PTA at the bottom. So you, you form these voids, uh, which of course are not good for device performance. Now, looking at the um, GVAX measurements, you can see that indeed it's confirmed that you have lead iodide uh, excess at the surface, especially if you do it slow, which is significantly more than what you observe in the, in the case of the um, fast deposition. Now in type 2 antisolvents, you can already notice here, it doesn't really matter if you do it fast or slow, you always have similar microstructure with a small excess of lead iodide on the surface, and I'll mention it briefly later, but you don't have any pinholes or voids, and so the films are very similar, and also the GVAX measurements confirm you only have perovskites with maybe a very tiny amount of lead iodide, and everything looks very similar. Finally, for type 3 antisolvents, you actually don't need to do any uh, complicated microscopy to see the difference because you can see it by eye. If you deposit the antisolvent too fast, what you do is you form a central spot in the area where your antisolvent landed first. And there you really have still a perovskite layer, but all around you have something gray, inhomogeneous, and um, basically you don't have complete coverage of your film. On the other hand, if you do it slowly, then you have full coverage of your film. Everything looks black. Everything is a perovskite. But we still examined this central spot uh, in the case of the fast deposited films and the full area in the slow one. And you can see the slow ones, they look pretty similar to type 2 antisolvent from before. So again, similarly large grains and a small excess of lead iodide, but no pinholes, no voids, nothing special. In the case of the fast deposited films, again, we're looking purely at the central spot. There, we actually see that we do form a perovskite. We do see some pinholes for toluene, but for the other solvents, we see that the central spot is okay. And that's already a first indication why we had this very large spread in the photovoltaic performance, because if your pixel happened to land on an area that was covered in perovskite, then it was a good perovskite. But if you happen to have a pixel which is on this gray area where you have incomplete coverage, of course, your performance will be very low. Um, and again, in terms of the uh, GVAX measurements, they're very similar for both fast and slow, which means the perovskite is formed very similarly. Now, understanding why would you categorize some solvents as type one and some as two and three, we looked, of course, at their basic properties, so the density, the boiling point, the dipole moment, but you can see that in each category, you have very you know, big changes in, the, in these um, properties. So you don't have anything in common when one would say, well, of course, it's the boiling point that is uh, um, affecting the categorization or something else. So it had to be something else that is uh, changing the way these antisolvents interact with the perovskite layer. And so to understand that better, we did a sort of a simulation of what is actually happening when we put our antisolvent onto our film. So when we started spin coating the perovskite um, solution, we have a wet film that is formed and it still has the MFDMSO as the um, host solvents. And then we put our antisolvent. So let's check what happens when we just have one of the components of our perovskite, in our case, MAI, in the MFDMSO, and then we top it up with the antisolvent, and we selected the volume ratio one to six because this roughly represents the similar ratio uh, of the volume of the wet film to the amount of antisolvent we are adding, which was 200 microliter. And so what we saw very clearly is that, first of all, it's crystal clear that there is a differentiation between the different antisolvents. So specifically, if we look at the alcohols, type one, MAI is fully soluble in these type 1 antisolvents. 
And the DMF, DMSO, and the anti-solvent are miscible, which means you don't observe any liquid-liquid interface between these solvents. Everything is miscible, everything is soluble. If you look at type two, you see that MEI is mostly insoluble with perhaps the exception of anti-solvent four, which you can see it partially dissolves MAI. And that's why I said it, it fits somewhere in between the two types. So it is a little bit acting like an alcohol, but on the other hand, it doesn't dissolve fully MAI. And that's why we categorize it as type two, even though it's really somewhere in between. Um, but you also see that despite the fact that MAI is not soluble in these antisolvents, the DMF, DMSO host solvents and the antisolvent are miscible. And then we have type three antisolvents where you can very clearly see that there is a liquid-liquid interface that is formed between the antisolvent to the DMF, DMSO, which, which means they are not miscible. So now with this knowledge, let's try to understand what is going on. So if we deposit our antisolvent onto our wet film that contains MAI, FAI, the solvents, of course, DMF, DMSO, and all the other precursors, but these are less relevant here, and we use type one antisolvent for making our film. If we do it fast, then what we can do is we don't have enough time to extract a lot MAI and FAI into the antisolvent that could be lost. And so all we do is we extract the DMF and the uh, DMSO across this liquid-liquid interface, and we form a good perovskite layer with almost no loss in organic halides uh, and no problems of de-wetting and so on. On the other hand, if you do it too slow, you lose a lot of the organic halides. And so that means you irreversibly alter your composition of your perovskite layer. And that creates a big amount of lead iodide at the surface and also some voids at the uh, interface to the PTA. Now, if you do it with type two antisolvents, these are antisolvents that can extract the MF, the MSO very efficiently because they're miscible with them, with uh, these uh, solvents. But because MAI and FAI are not soluble, they're not extracted from the wet film. And so you don't change the composition and you end up with both fast and slow, giving you equally good uh, perovskite film. And finally, if you do it with type three antisolvents, these antisolvents, they are not good at extracting the MF and the MSO because they're not miscible with it, which means you need more time to actually be able to extract these antisolvents, uh, these, sorry, these host solvents and uh, trigger the crystallization. And so if you do it too fast, you will end up with a poorly formed perovskite film where only the center has actually formed the perovskite uh, because that's the point where the longest amount of time there was of contact between the antisolvent and the um, and the perovskite layer. But if you do it slowly, then you get a good quality perovskite film because you had enough time to extract the DMF, DMSO. So there was still one thing that troubled us a little bit. And I wanna show you here why understanding what causes reproducibility issues can actually be very helpful for improving the performance of the devices. And the question was here, if we're looking at type two antisolvent, okay, so we said perhaps these are the best ones to use because they are not very sensitive to the speed. Um, we still see excess lead iodide at the surface, even though we're making a perfectly stoichiometric perovskite solution. So we don't add any excess lead iodide. We would have expected that we have no lead iodide at the surface. So that suggests that even though MAI and FAI are not very soluble in these solvents, perhaps not enough for us to observe it in a simple solubility test, uh, but some small amounts of MAI and FAI are being able to be extracted by these antisolvents and then they are washed off. And so what we decided is why not simply change the way you deposit your uh, antisolvent? So we typically use a pipette, but you can very easily, here I have one, you can very easily use one of those. Um, spraying bottles and just spray your antisolvent on top of your perovskite layer. You don't need any complicated uh, setup. It's, a, it's what's called a um, um, carrier gas-free setup. So you basically have a little bottle and you spray, it's a perfume bottle. And um, we tested uh, this and can you make layers with that? Perhaps that way you will uh, not remove so much of these organic halides and can preserve your perovskite composition. And this is exactly what happens because when you spray your antisolvent, you can see that the amount of excess lead iodide formed at the surface is significantly reduced, and you much better preserve the stoichiometry of the perovskite that you wanted to make. 
We also perform GVEX measurements and we show that this happens not only on the surface, but even at the bulk of the layer, we have significantly less lead iodide than in the case of the pipetite and dissolvent. So what does it do to your device? It actually improves the performance. So everything else is kept the same, um, but you can see that you can gain a, sort of roughly 1% in absolute numbers of your device performance simply by swapping from a pipette to one of these little bottles. What is also quite interesting is that you can significantly reduce the amount of antisolvent you are using, which is a, a bit of an issue with pipetting. Um, maybe those of you who have tested, if you lower the volume of antisolvent when you pipe it, actually the performance goes down because you need enough of it to actually wet the entire film. But when you do it with one of these bottles, you can go to as little as 60 micro uh, liters and you still have a very nice photovoltaic performance, which does not change if you increase or decrease the volume. So why is spraying better? Uh, there are two reasons really. First of all, when you deposit the orange solvent by spraying, it creates a mist of small droplets, which means the volume of each individual droplet is so small that that limits the solubility of MAI, FAI in those droplets. And that means you actually extract less of it from your layer, you end up with a much better preservation of your um, stoichiometry. And moreover, the drying is much faster. You have a very big surface area of these little droplets. So the antisolvent evaporates much quicker and you end up with a um, lower interaction time between your antisolvent and your film. So with this, I wanna conclude. I hope I showed you two examples where hidden parameters uh, that you might not be aware of uh, can very strongly influence both the properties of the perovskite layers as well as the performance and stability of uh, solar cells. And uh, by doing a lot of detailed work, we were able to identify two such parameters. So first of all, the fractional deviations in precursor stoichiometry. And the second one is the rate of the antisolvent deposition step, which as you saw happen absolutely accidentally, but it's um, hopefully will be useful for you to really monitor uh, how fast you deposit your antisolvent. And what we observed is that if you do control for this rate of antisolvent deposition, you can fabricate high efficiency devices from essentially any antisolvent, so long as you understand its interaction with the well, uh, wet perovskite film. And finally, I showed you that spraying the antisolvent is a very simple method, but it increases the device efficiency. So with this, I wanna thank my group. Uh, as you can see, it's a, a somewhat recent photo. And I have marked here all the group members who have contributed to the studies that I presented here in blue. And of course, I have to uh, thank our funding agencies and you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your presentation. It was very really nice work. I have read your uh, paper actually, um, I think twice. I was uh, hoping that you also mentioned about the excess of PBI2 because I think in your paper you mentioned at the end that this excess of PBI2 that I are mentioning in the papers is actually uh, not quite correct. And uh, you mentioned that uh, we have to keep the full stoichiometry balance actually for yeah. triple cation perovskites. Is that so, true? I wanted to get the confirmation again. Yeah, exactly. So we observe that if you work with the recipe that is most commonly used, where you do have some excess lead iodide, um, you don't get the best performance uh, and it impacts negatively on the stability as well. That's, I think, well known that excess lead iodide um, negatively impacts on stability. But what you do gain is you gain reproducibility. Because you saw, for example, for the two students who were making the layers differently with the different pipette tips, right? They ended up with the same performance in the range where there was excess lead iodide, but they ended up with different performance in the range where they, it was either stoichiometric or um, with some deficiency of lead iodide. And so it's a question of what do you want? If you all want to be more confident that you all get similar results, then yes, you might want to add your excess lead iodide. But if you are aiming for high performance and high stability, I do recommend to go for a perfectly stoichiometric composition and really monitor carefully your deposition parameters, both the stoichiometry, so measure everything very, very accurately, and the um, 
anti-solvent application rate, depending on the anti-solvent you are using, check which category it falls into and then use the right speed of application. Or alternatively, simply buy yourself one of these. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, there are some questions from the audience online. Uh, uh, let me read one and then we pass to somebody here. Uh, um, I think they are passing very fast. Jenna, can you see the uh, questions? Yeah, maybe I, I for everybody I could I could read it. So yes, please. Um, how can you be sure that you cover the entire surface area with the antisolvent droplet? So I guess you're asking about the spring. So actually, the area that you cover with the antisolvent is much larger than your um, sample area. So and you can do it very in a very simple way. You know, again, you get rid of one of these. Use a colored liquid, maybe put some, I don't know, food coloring inside and spray. And you can easily see how much you spray. And we observed that this is significantly larger. So we are absolutely confident that the entire sample size is covered with the droplets. Um, the question regarding the next one is how much volume do you spray as the undissolvent and how long does it take for spraying? Okay. So um, I showed you data comparing 60 microliters and 200 microliters. So how do you control how much you put? Because you press just once, right? No problem, press twice, right? You press two times, you spray uh, more. Uh, the other way to control how much you are putting is changing the distance. So we have, by now, because we quite like this spring, we have um, a, a little self-made sample holder, not sample holder, but rather this thing holder, right? We put our bottle inside, and then we can just tune the distance from the sample uh, that we are spraying onto one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters. Of course, as you are further and further away, your cone of spraying is increasing, but then the volume of antisolvent that lands on your sample is decreasing. And so we are using typically heights of uh, one or two centimeters away. Um, and I think that was actually one of the other questions. Yeah, what should be the distance of the spray method? How much antisolvent should be? And is this, can, can it be used for scalable size? So for scalable, there are some works where antisolvents were sprayed by using carrier gas systems, which means you have, for example, oxygen typically or nitrogen carrying your droplets out. So this is also the technique used very often. I know you do a lot of work on oxides for, for example, for spray pyrolysis. So you then drive your precursors using a carrier gas. Uh, and I think for large area, indeed, you need a more, you know, industrially compatible spraying system. But for small lab scale fabrication, these guys are doing a great job already. You don't really need anything complicated. Um, let me see. How do you measure the amount of undissolvent that comes out of the spray bottle each time you squeeze? Have you seen influence on the results according to the distance between the substrate and the bottle? Yeah. So I already mentioned that the distance is going to impact how much a dissolvent actually lands on your sample. But if you spray, you saw between 60 to 200, it's really quite flat. So you have very similar performance. So you, 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 you are no longer as sensitive to the volume as you would be if you would be doing the pipetting. Um, and how much, how do you measure? Again, you can do a reference experiment where you just spray a colored solvent onto your, um, even on a piece of paper. And then you can simply calculate the area of your sample versus the full area that has been sprayed. And then you can estimate what was your um, um, solvent coverage. You can also just spray uh, onto a vial and then weigh it. And then you would know exactly how much antisolvent you had introduced. Um, I think there are some more questions. Um, are there lessons to be learned from your work for scalable deposition methods, plate coating, slot dye, and so on? Absolutely. I think in particular, when it comes to the importance of stoichiometry, because we observed, you know, once we've done this study, and this was already a few years ago, but we really realized how critical the stoichiometry is. And so I always tell my students, make sure you're exactly at 3.00. You want to be as close to the, the stoichiometric composition as possible. And even with the best intentions and, you know, the best balance and the best, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, calibrated pipettes, you always end up either slightly above or slightly below. Because 
just one droplet here or there changes everything. And then all your properties are different. And so of course, when you now start thinking about large scale and you have multiple batches running one after the other, small errors that are completely unintentional will cause you know, one batch to be better performing, the next one less well performing. Um, and so, and, and, and in techniques where one would use uh, the um, anti-solvent, again, especially on a large scale, you have, I think, much less control uh, related to the speed of the position because you're talking about large volumes, volumes of anti-solvent that have to be deposited. So I think even that will be um, quite important. Moreover, I would mention that in our work, we do some um, experiments with thermally evaporated perovskites. And there, the stoichiometric ratio of the components you evaporate is absolutely critical. And what we observed is that you have your evaporation chamber and you use the same rates as before, but now your chamber is already coated in some of these precursors and they also start to evaporate. And then you basically can, as you progressively make more and more batches, you continuously and gradually change your composition completely unintentionally. And so it's important also for large scale fabrication by thermal evaporation, of course. Um, okay, yeah. Sorry, Jana. Yeah. Just one minute, uh, one question, because it's related to the last question you answered from the online people. Uh, for large scale, then, I mean, there are people that use uh, slow dye, and others use uh, roll to roll, inject, uh, and there is also spraying. So maybe do you think, or have you seen anything, any relation between these deposition methods and these uh, problems that you see? in a small scale? I mean, maybe is, is probably spraying the best method to use for large, large scale? I think spraying uh, of the anti-solvent is definitely something that will be very helpful. Spraying of the precursor solution itself could be tricky because the homogeneity is of course impacted. You, again, you deposit this uh, mist of droplets rather than, than the full coating. So I could imagine a combination type technique where you deposit, you know, you maybe print your perovskite layer, but then spray your anti-solvent to trigger the crystallization. Um, but of course, you know, we, we don't do very large devices. I think the biggest we maybe could do is maybe five by five. So it's a centimeter. So it's really not very large. Um, I think these are very important industrial questions that, that people have to look at. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that this issue of reproducibility is quite special to perovskites. It doesn't really exist to this degree in organic solar cells or, or other solar cells. And so I think maybe that's another reason why uh, we haven't seen industrial products just yet, because you have to make them reproducible and not every time something else, right? Okay, thank you. Any other question from the from the audience, uh, Jana? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Yeah, it's a very exhaustive analysis. <laughs> so my question was like you mentioned that the issue is that the antisolvent dissolves the organic halides. So do you think a solution maybe to pre-dissolve in the anti-solvent the organic halides just before doing it? Yeah, so we tried that as well, actually. We tried adding um, small amounts of MAI into the anti-solvent and then basically using that as the um, um, anti-solvent. So the first problem is that that limits you to anti-solvents that can dissolve MAI. So that limits you to basically the category of alcohols. We also tried uh, blends. So you would have, for example, a type two antisolvent and a type one antisolvent mixed together. And then the MAI is in the type one in the alcohol and I don't know, TFT or whatever else you, you like to use uh, in the type two uh, that is actually using used for the crystallization triggering. We do not observe that you can increase the performance by doing that, but you definitely increase the stability which again is related to the fact that you have less lead iodide than you would have had if you don't use any excess MAI in the antisolvent. So, but we, we realized that this, we, we looked at that and we thought maybe that's a path to sort of compensate for the losses. 
but we realized that even then you add one additional component that could introduce irreproducibility because you know the amount that is dissolved the mixture of the of the volumes of the two antisolvents and the deposition uh, so we actually gave up and we prefer to do something as easy as spraying yeah thank you somebody else Fanny. yes hi thank you for a very nice presentation uh, i just maybe it's something i missed but uh, what was the stacking that you used for, for this experiment did you always use the same uh, stacking for the cell so for the MAPI, it was um glass ito p dot perovskite pcbm bcp silver so it's a very standard uh, inverted architecture device for the triple cation study we use instead of p dot pta and the rest is all the same so we find that with p dot triple cation doesn't work i guess everybody else already realized that as well nobody's using that architecture uh, and so we use PTA instead. Okay, thank you. We can continue with the questions from online, Jana. Yeah, um, so let me see where we were. Uh, do you think access of lead iodide in sublimation method would have the same effect, meaning the lead iodide access increases the VOC but decreases the stability? So we actually observed when, that you, when you don't have excess lead iodide, you increase the VOC. So what we, in, in the example with the spraying, I showed you that the performance increased and the key in terms of parameters to the increase is actually the VOC. And when you do then PL measurements on these films, sprayed versus uh, pipetted, you clearly see that the PLQE of the sprayed films is much higher. And that means that you have reduced amount of non-radiative recombination, so you have a higher VOC. And so I believe that's the reason why we should all work in the perfect stoichiometric composition, because there we don't have this excess lead iodide, so we don't sacrifice neither, neither efficiency nor stability. So I would not, I personally don't really um, recommend using lead, lead iodide excess unless you have a device architecture where you're going to use this lead iodide access for something else. For example, if you're forming 3D, 2D interfaces, you need some lead iodide access at the top so that you can put your A cation and convert it to the, to the perovskite. So that's okay. That's, you know, you are actually going to do something with it to convert it to perovskite. But if you're simply working in a basic triple cation configuration, you have excess lead iodide, it is going to limit the stability and even the efficiency, especially the VOC. Um, then there is another question from Lucia. So in your lab, using the antisolvent spraying method and controlling precisely the stoichiometry, did you improve considerably the reproducibility of the devices? Well, what should I say? Yes and no. These are two hidden factors, but there are many more hidden factors. And one of those we recently um, have been looking into, and that is something that we have very little control over, but it seems to heavily impact the device performance and the stability, and that is the exact precursor bottle you're getting from your supplier. So we compared nine bottles of the same precursor, same purity, everything same, and we get nine different variations, not only in the maximum performance, but also in the spread. Some bottles give you very nice reproducibility, some give you a huge spread. And this is something that you know, when we even show this data to the suppliers themselves, they say, no, it's the purity we promise, we don't know anything else. But the reality is that this is something that we, you know, we have very little control. So we would buy a bottle, test it. If it good gives results, we do science. And if not, we put it away and we buy the next one. It's not very sustainable and it's really, you know, not, not great for, for, for continuing, but this is something we observe. Um, that's still impacting the reproducibility of the of the devices very heavily. I mean, I guess you maybe encounter this in your lab, Monica. We have sometimes lead iodide that it doesn't dissolve in the MF. We always buy it from the same uh, company, always. And in fact, they are, they are what? Do you see differences in performance between different batches? Uh, of I mean, I think there is a very well knowledge in in many laboratories that if you buy it from this company, it will work well. And I remember there was a, a cut of, on the production of, of this lead iodine from this company, I think two years ago. 
And everybody, many laboratories that we know went crazy because they didn't have the correct re reactant and all deficiencies were low for probably yeah. two or three months. It was a, and, and everybody relies on that company. It's a yep. big problem. Yeah. yeah. Especially so this, is, this is a major issue. I, I don't know if you also observed that, but we think we don't have any proof that honestly the weather <laughs> impacts <laughs> the yeah. performance, even though we fabricate everything in a dry box. So uh, yes, we, if it rain. <laughs> we here in Barcelona have more humidity in summer. It's for sure the efficiency is lower in summer than in winter. That's what we also observe. Yeah. Okay, so we are in agreement on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, yes. Any other, um, any other question? Yeah. Well, there's one more question related to the architecture. So do you use tin oxide as ETL or <laughs> do you fabricate everything in the inverted? We prefer the inverted architecture, generally speaking. We do try, especially when you know we show something and then the referee is always, and is it the same for the standard architecture? And so basically they ask us to double the, the, the study. And so we do sometimes make devices with um, tin oxide as ETL, um, but it's not as well optimized as our inverted architecture devices. So it will be you know, not as high efficiency as, as uh, reported. We tried the recipe from um, uh, the 25.2% paper, uh, but it doesn't work for us. So we, we can't reproduce it. Nobody can. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I'm sure some some do, but yeah, I know in my congratulations is twenty five point six right now. So oh wow, but they are all, yeah, but they are always there. Okay, so if there are no any other questions, I don't know if here in the room we have any other question. No, I think is uh, we are going to leave it here, Jana. It's very interesting for me to to see your presentation. I knew you work very interesting. Maybe we can keep talking about future collaborations between our sure. groups. Okay, I'm very happy to have you here. Thank you for accepting the invitation. And if we have any other question, we will, for the people in the audience online, uh, we can send it to Jana directly if you want to contact us with, with more questions. Thank you very much, Jana. Thank you everybody for being here. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you.